So welcome back friends we are now moving on to the next topic on neck swellings okay we are moving on to the topic on neck swellings the various swellings in the neck we are going to discuss one by one okay we are going to discuss about the various swellings in the neck so before going to the neck swellings i want you to know about the neck triangles what are the triangles in the neck please remember this is sternocleidomastoid muscle this is sternocleidomastoid this is trapezius this is clavical this is midline please don't forget this is clavical seen in the in this place this is clavical so now i am going to show you all the triangles which are seen in the neck so please understand the landmarks this is a hyoid bone this is hyoid bone and this muscle is anterior belly of digastric and this muscle is posterior belly of digastric so now you can see there is one triangle formed very well between the anterior belly of digastric posterior belly of digastric hyoid bone and mandible this triangle is known as digastric triangle digastric triangle also known as submandibular triangle also known as submandibular triangle bounded by anterior belly of digastric posterior belly of digastric and hyoid bone as an apex and mandible forming the base is a classical digastric triangle i want you to remember this is digastric triangle seen in this place so number 2 the other triangle i am going to show you now this is one muscle known as superior belly of homohyoid and this is inferior belly of homohyoid so now you can see here very very important triangle i want to tell you this is a very important triangle this triangle which i have highlighted in yellow color is known as carotid triangle it is known as carotid triangle bounded by posterior belly of digastric superior belly of homohyoid superior belly of homohyoid superior belly of posterior belly of digastric superior belly of homohyoid and sternocleidomastoid and sternocleidomastoid muscle so this three together posterior belly of digastric superior belly of homohyoid and sternocleidomastoid together forms the triangle carotid triangle that forms a triangle carotid triangle and in in fact we have a triangle already formed here in front known as muscular triangle known as muscular triangle so muscular triangle is bounded by hyoid bone hyoid bone superior belly of homohyoid so please remember don't forget this is superior belly of homohyoid i'm showing you the triangle this is hyoid bone this is superior belly of homohyoid sternocleidomastoid muscle and this is midline so this is the triangle i'm telling you known as muscular triangle so hyoid bone superior belly of homohyoid sternocleidomastoid and midline so this is muscular triangle so hyoid bone superior belly of homohyoid sternocleidomastoid and this midline this forms a triangle known as muscular triangle and there is one more triangle anteriorly that is seen in the submental region known as submental triangle submental triangle is between the two belly of anterior belly of digastric between the two anterior belly of digastric we have this submental triangle so here in front if you see this is anterior belly of digastric this is anterior belly of digastric this is mandible and this is hyoid bone that is submandibular triangle so these are the anterior triangles i want you to remember these are the anterior triangles carotid triangle muscular triangle digastric and submandibular and coming to posterior triangles there are two posterior triangles one is suboccipital suboccipital triangle bounded by sternocleidomastoid trapezius and inferior belly of homohyoid inferior belly of homohyoid so this is the suboccipital triangle and the other one which is shown here is known as supraclavicular triangle this is known as supraclavicular triangle supraclavicular triangle bounded by inferior belly of homohyoid inferior belly of homohyoid sternocleidomastoid and clavicle and clavical inferior belly of homohyoid sternocleidomastoid and clavical this is a supraclavicular triangle so suboccipital triangle and supraclavicular triangle are the two posterior triangle so as mbbs graduates you should not forget any of these triangles all these tang triangles are very important for your exams so please don't forget the triangles in the neck only when you know the anatomy you will know about the neck swellings what is the most common swelling in the neck overall in the neck what is the most common swelling the most common swelling in the neck is lymph node node is a most common swelling in the neck so there are many other swellings in the neck i uh, if you if we go on discussion there are so many swellings but i want to tell you 
about the two important triangles that is carotid triangle carotid triangle and posterior triangle we want to discuss about these two carotid triangle and posterior triangle so what are all the solid swellings i am going to discuss what are all the liquid filled swellings i am going to discuss what is the gas filled swelling i am going to discuss in each i am going to tell you now carotid triangle in this carotid triangle the solid swelling is carotid body tumor carotid body tumor in the posterior triangle the solid solid swelling is cervical rib it is cervical rib liquid filled swelling in carotid triangle is branchial cyst branchial cyst in posterior swelling the carot uh, air filled liquid filled swelling is cystic hygroma so the carotid triangle the air filled swelling is what is the air filled swelling here it is laryngocele laryngocele is an air filled swelling in the carotid triangle and pharyngeal pouch is a air filled swelling in the posterior triangle so please remember you can get any one of this as mcq where is the swelling seen which is the site of each swelling so please don't forget carotid triangle gets carotid body tumor branchial cyst and laryngocele posterior triangle gets cervical rib cystic hygroma pharyngeal pouch all this can be sitting on the posterior triangle so please don't forget these are the swellings i am going to discuss now in detail one by one we are going to discuss in detail so let me start my discussion with carotid body tumor carotid body tumor we are going to start our discussion with so carotid body tumor as you all know very well it is a non it's a it's a chemodectoma it is also known as chemodectoma it is also known as chemodectoma it is a non promaffin paraganglioma it is a non promaffin paraganglioma it is also known as potato tumor it is also known as potato tumor so chemodectoma non promaffin paraganglioma potato tumor all the other names of carotid body tumor what is carotid body tumor so please remember carotid body tumor this is a bifurcation of common carotid artery this is internal carotid artery going inside which is having no branch in the neck and this is external carotid artery with all its branches with all its branches external carotid artery so now we should understand what are these carotid bodies these carotid bodies are small receptors chemo receptors seen on the posterior medial surface on the posterior medial surface of common carotid artery bifurcation posterior medial surface of the common carotid artery bifurcation we have small small receptors these receptors are stimulated by hypoxia please remember they are stimulated by hypoxia stimulates the receptor and as these receptors are stimulated the patient takes more breathing and there is more oxygen consumption this is a phenomenon so chemo receptor it acts as a chemo receptor which is seen posterior medial to the common carotid artery when there is an hypoxia these receptors are stimulated and they cause hyperventilation of the patient and the patient will stagnate more oxygen in his body that is the function of this receptors so therefore there are some patients who will have constant hypoxia example people living in high altitude people living in high altitude people who are having cyanotic heart disease cyanotic heart disease and people living in high altitude these guys will have persistent hypoxia please remember these guys will have persistent hypoxia and their carotid body is continuously stimulated and they grow 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 like this and they become a tumor so one of the important etiology is high altitude and cyanotic heart disease so when i am going to examine this swelling what are the clinical features i get clinical features of carotid body tumor are it is firm like a potato consistency potato like firm tumor it is a potato firm consistency seen on palpation if you see it is having a potato firm consistency and please don't forget it is common in middle aged females more common in middle aged females certain classical findings to say this is carotid body tumor i am going to tell you certain findings so usually it is unilateral it is not seen bilateral it is usually unilateral i am showing you that tumor it is usually unilateral it is seen on anterior triangle of neck it is usually unilateral seen on anterior triangle of neck 
it is seen on anterior triangle of neck it is unilateral and it is firm in consistency it is firm in consistency it is mobile side to side it is mobile side to side it cannot be mobile vertically but it is mobile side to side mobility present but not mobile vertically not mobile vertically this sign is known as what is the name of this sign can you tell me it can be moved side to side but cannot be moved upwards it is known as fontaine sign fontaine sign this sign is known as fontaine sign is you can move it side to side but it cannot be moved vertically vertically so another important point is when you examine the swelling this swelling has a transmitted pulsation please remember it will have a transmitted pulsation i hope you know the difference between transmitted pulsation and expansile pulsation so when you keep two fingers on the swelling if the two fingers are only lifted it is known as transmitted pulsation if i keep two fingers on a swelling if the fingers are lifted and separated like this it is known as expansile pulsation if i keep two fingers lifting of my fingers is transmitted pulsation lifting and separation of the fingers is expansile pulsation please remember this so expansile pulsation is seen only in aneurysms expansile is seen in aneurysms so this transmitted pulsation is seen in swelling sitting on an artery any swelling sitting on an artery will have transmitted pulsation so this is actually having a transmitted pulsation so the incidence of this disease is very 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 rare so the incidence of this carotid body tumor is 0.5% or less than 0.5% only and this carotid body tumor can be malignant can go for malignancy in around 10% cases it can be malignant also it is usually benign but it can be going for malignancy also it can be malignant in around 10% cases so this carotid body tumor has a classification known as shamblin classification shamblin classification is not essential for pg level just for completion i'm telling you shamblin classification helps us in management that is why i'm telling this 1 2 3 so 1 2 3 what is shamblin 1 2 3 in shamblin type 1 the tumor is just just attached just adherent to the artery less than 25% area only it is adherent just adherent less than 25% area so nothing to worry you can casually excise the tumor only without any major issue fixation of the tumor alone is enough only 25% it is attached no so you can very casually dissect it and you can remove it excision of tumor is enough for shamblin 1 shamblin 2 shamblin type 2 has at infiltration which is more in the artery which will be around 50% or around 50% it is in adherent it is around 50% adherent so 50% adherent means we have to be little careful we should have three point control we should have a control in this artery we should have a control in this artery we should have a control in this artery and we should be ready to face the common carotid artery or internal carotid artery or external carotid artery injury during surgery so we can we have to expect it so therefore i should excise the tumor with a three point control here also the same treatment excision with a three point control three place we have to have a control control means we keep ready in the in case there is a bleeding we will put a bulldog clamp in all the three places with three point control we should do when it is more than 50% infiltrated or in otherwise it is encasing the vessel it is encasing the vessel means the tumor is fully engulfing the vessel Engul encasing the vessel such cases only we need to do resection of the artery resect the common carotid artery and use internal jugular vein as graft you can use the internal jugular vein as graft for artery so remove the artery along with the tumor and use a internal jugular vein as a grafting so this is about the shamblin classification why i am telling shamblin classification is because it helps me in my helps me in my management excision of the tumor if it is less than 25% adherent excision with three point control if it is 50% adherent resect the common carotid artery and use internal jugular vein graft if there is a encasement of the vessel i should go for a resection and use ijv grafting so please don't forget this point very important for your exams shamblin classification shamblin classification so now i'm coming to the diagnosis investigation of choice to diagnose please remember fnac or biopsy if you tell in your exams in your final year you are failed 
FNAC or biopsy is contraindicated. Please don't forget this. If you do FNAC or biopsy from the lesion, it will bleed like anything. So they are contraindicated. So if at all, what is investigation of choice? If at all, you should tell only investigation of choice is angiogram. Angiogram will show you splaying of common carotid arteries known as liar sign. Liar sign means splaying of common. I will show you the image. Splaying or means splaying means separating of common carotid artery branches. So the two branches which will be running like this will now deviate and run like this. This is known as splaying of common carotid artery. We want you to remember and if at all you can also do duplex scan also P can be done. Duplex scan can be done. But investigation of choices, please remember angiogram is the investigation of choice. I want you to remember. So now we have dissected and removed the tumor by our technique. Now the complications, what are the complications of surgery? So I want you to remember certain basic MCQs. First important MCQ, the most common nerve injured. What is the most common nerve injured? The most common nerve injured during the excision of the carotid body tumor is superior laryngeal nerve. It is superior laryngeal nerve is the most common nerve injured. That is the most common nerve injured during surgery. And there is one more syndrome happening during the surgery known as first bite syndrome. What is this first bite syndrome? This is a syndrome in which when I am removing the tumor, I can, re I can damage of sympathetic plexus happens. Damage of sympathetic nerves around the common carotid artery happens. Damage of sympathetic nerves that results in re-innervation. Re-innervation of the sympathetic by parasympathetic branches. So it is just opposite to Frey syndrome. In Frey syndrome, there is damage of parasympathetic with the re-innervation by sympathetic. Here, there is damage of sympathetic nerves with the re-innervation by parasympathetic nerve that results in pain happening in the neck as you start chewing. Pain in the neck. Pain in the neck. On starting to chew, you get pain in the neck. So this is very important complication. I want you to remember, so you should not forget first bite syndrome. It is just opposite to Frey syndrome. It is just opposite to Frey syndrome. Please don't forget the complications. Most common nerve injured is superior laryngeal nerve and first bite syndrome. Please don't forget these two. So if it is a malignant carotid body tumor, if it is malignant, we have to give post-op radiotherapy also. Post-op radiotherapy is given if it is malignant. Okay. Pre-op has no value. Please remember pre-op radiotherapy is not given. It is not having any value. Only we can give post-op radiotherapy for these patients. So these are the points I want to tell you about carotid body tumor. Let me show you the image of carotid body tumor. You can see this is a picture showing you a carotid body tumor. You can see a carotid body tumor on an MR reconstructive angiogram. This is a carotid body tumor you are seeing here in a reconstructive angiogram and this is known as liar sign. So please don't forget this is known as liar sign in which angiogram shows splaying of common carotid arteries. In this picture you can see there is a splaying of common carotid arteries. This is known as liar sign. Okay. So now that is about the first swelling carotid body tumor. Next I am moving on to very very important topic that is cervical rib cervical rib and before doing cervical rib I am going to discuss about thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome very very important topic in this chapter this is the most important topic I want you to remember thoracic outlet syndrome. So now I am going to show you some anatomy please don't get confused in this anatomy very important this is C7 this is T1 from T1 you can see the first rib I am drawing here this is the first rib attached to the manubrium sterni. Okay, this is first rib and now you are going to see some muscles. This is scalenous anterior muscle. Please remember this is scalenous anterior muscle attached to the first rib. Scalenous anterior muscle and this is scalenous post, scalenous medius muscle attached to the first rib. So these are all arising from transverse process of cervical spine, scalenous anterior and scalenous medius. So please remember now in this place you are seeing a triangle formed. Can you see the triangle? This triangle is known as scalene triangle. So scalene triangle boundaries are recently asked me PG 2019 MCQ bounded by scalenous anterior, scalenous medius and clavicle are the boundaries of scalene triangle. Scalenous anterior, scalenous medius and clavicle are the boundaries of scalene triangle. What are the contents in this triangle? Please remember the contents coming out of this triangle. Number one, it is subclavian artery is going to come out from this triangle. So this is a subclavian artery 
which is coming out as a branch of brachiocephalic trunk. This is a right subclavian artery coming out. So, right side subclavian artery is coming out of the triangle. And similarly, we can also have three nerves coming out. What are these three nerves? Can you tell me? It is brachial plexus, upper trunk, middle trunk and lower trunk of brachial plexus is also going to come out of this triangle known as scalene triangle. So, this is a, this triangle is seen here, this triangle is seen in this place, it is pakka, it is not, it not compressed, patient is having a normal. Sometimes what happens, some problems, one of the most important problem is cervical rib arising from C7, it can come into this triangle like this and it can cause compression of this triangle. So this is one of the cause of the thoracic outlet syndrome. So, the most common cause of scalene triangle compression. Most common cause of scalene triangle compression is known as cervical rib. That is the most common cause overall. Cervical rib is the most common cause overall that is the most common cause. Please do not forget. So, not only cervical rib, there are many more causes, I will tell you later, but cervical rib is one of the most common causes. As cervical rib is coming and compressing here, you can develop two problems. One is a problem due to subclavian artery compression known as thoracic outlets syndrome of vascular type. We call it as vascular TOS. We call it as vascular thoracic outlet syndrome. And another is the compression of the brachial plexus. We call it as Neurogenic Thoracic Outlet Syndrome. Neurogenic Thoracic Outlet Syndrome. Very, very important. So, the Thoracic Outlet Syndrome is of two types. It is due to neurogenic or due to vascular. The most common type in cervical rib is thora vascular thoracic outlet syndrome. So, the vascular subclavian artery gets compressed. What are the clinical features? The patient has subclavian artery compressed here. So, the patient has pain when he starts working with his hands. As he starts working with his hands, he will get pain. That pain we call it as intermittent claudication of upper limb. We call it as intermittent claudication of upper limb. Because of poor blood flow, intermittent claudication, you can see ulcers seen in the hand, gangrene can happen in the digits. I will show you these images. So, these are the features of vascular thoracic outlet syndrome. Whereas, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, the most common nerve compressed is which one? So, the most common nerve compressed is, please do not forget it is ulnar nerve. It is C8 T1 that is the lower trunk is commonly compressed. So, the lower trunk of brachial plexus is commonly compressed. So, they have ulnar nerve area pain. So, they will have pain along the medial side of arm and medial side of forearm. So, what is the classical feature? Pain along the medial arm and forearm. Pain along medial side of arm and forearm arm or forearm. This is a classical feature of neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. So, neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome and vascular thoracic outlet syndrome. Please do not forget. Neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome, the most common nerve compressed is ulnar nerve and vascular thoracic outlet syndrome, the common problems are pain. So, these two cases will manifest in a overt way or they can be silently remaining like an occult way. So, one another problem which will happen in a vas vascular thoracic outlet syndrome is, I am going to show you now. So, as you all know, from the subclavian artery, this is a branch from a subclavian artery, first part of subclavian artery, this is a branch going like this. From the subclavian artery, this is a branch going like this known as vertebral artery. So, vertebral artery is a branch from subclavian artery going like this, which is going to join with the circle of villus and going to supply the brain. So, if, if there is a compression in this place in subclavian artery, there is a compression in this place because of the cervical rib, what happens? The vertebral artery gives a collateral to the upper limb like this, will give a collateral to the upper limb like this. A new collateral develops from here to upper limb. When the subclavian artery is compressed, a subclavian artery compression causes a collateral developing from to coming to the upper limb. So, therefore, what happens? When the patient starts working with his hand, the blood flow to the brain will stop. The blood flow to the brain will stop and the blood will flow to the upper limb. That is known as a phenomenon known as subclavian steel phenomenon. This is also a feature of vascular thoracic outlet syndrome, subclavian steel phenomenon. So, what happens here? The patient will complains of giddiness as he starts working, complains of giddiness as he starts working. 
So you, as he starts working with the hand, for example, he starts washing clothes or start writing, he will complain of giddiness because the blood is not flowing to the brain. So classical feature. It is due to vertebral artery blood getting diverted to the upper limb. This phenomenon is also seen. Subclavian steel phenomenon is seen. So now, what are all the clinical examination findings? I want you to know what are all the clinical examination findings in these cases. So I am going to examine a girl with a cervical rib. This girl is having a cervical rib now. What are all the findings? I am going to tell you. So this is a clavicle, this is a posterior clavicle, this is mastoid muscle. So just see, as you are going to examine this girl, the girl may have a bony swelling here. The girl will have a bony swelling above the clavicle. This bony swelling is nothing but cervical rib. On close examination, you can see a cervical rib in the posterior triangle in the base. It is a swelling in posterior triangle base. Posterior triangle base has this swelling. It is bony heart swelling, bony heart swelling. Sometimes you can see a post stenotic aneurysm. You can sometimes palpate a post stenotic aneurysm of subclavian artery. Subclavian artery aneurysms can be sometimes palpated. Because of the stenosis, we can see a aneurysm happening in the subclavian artery that also can be palpated. And now I want to test, I want to test for the thoracic outlet syndrome signs. I will do some tests. So please remember, I will do some tests. What are the tests? Let me tell you the tests are AdSense test, Ruse test, AdSense test, Ruse test, and Halstead test, Right test. All these are tests to look for whether there is an occlusion of the artery. I am going to look for the occlusion of the artery by means of some test. So I am going to show you all the tests now. So test number one, AdSense test, extend the limb like this outside and turn to the same side and take a deep breath. So please remember AdSense test, extend the limb to same, to, to the, this I am having a cervical rib here, extend the limb like this, turn the same side and take a deep breath. If I am going to take a deep breath, the radial artery pulse decreases, the radial artery pulse decreases, the radial artery pulse dynamicity decreases not the rate, it is dynamics, dynamicity of the pulse decreases, which is easily palpable now, will not become much palpable. That is a typical thing because of the compression of subclavian artery, that is AdSense test. Ruse test, I am doing the Ruse test, ask the patient to do like this and keep on doing like this. Ask the patient to do like this and keep on doing like this. So when they do on like this, they will have pain and they will leave the hand down. Because of claudication, they will have pain, that is a Ruse test clenching of fingers, clenching of fingers in an abducted position, Halstead test, ask the patient to stand in a military position, like a military man, like a military man, when they stand like a military position, they will get pain in the arm. So the pain, we are, we are bringing out the claudication pain by doing some manuals, that's all. So right test video came in recent aims, people all wrote it as a ruse test, I'll tell you the right test is. Ask the patient to hyperextend the hand like this and touch the ear like this and keep for some time. Hyperextend the hand and keep the hand like this and you can see if there is a cervical rib here, the patient will have pain in the arm. So right test is hyperabduction, hyperabduction test. So please don't forget AdSense test is commonly done. Look for radial artery pulse by turning to same side. Ruse test is clinching of fingers. Halstead test is military position, right test is pain in the arm in hyperabduction. These are all tests usually done to rule out an occult thoracic outlet syndrome. Over cases you can find out from seeing the uh, gangrene of the fingers, all those things. But if it is occult, we can bring out by doing this test. So now let me discuss one by one the various causes of thoracic outlet syndrome. Let us start with cervical rib. Now let me tell you the various causes of this type of thoracic outlet syndrome. Cervical rib, let me start with. Cervical rib is 50% time bilateral. Please remember it is 50% time bilateral. It is common in young age. It is common in young age. So interesting point about cervical rib is in it is full rib in some patients. It is a complete rib. It can be a complete rib like this or it can be a partial rib like this or it can be a partial rib with a fibrous cord like this 
or it can be a full fibrous cord like this. These are the types of cervical rib. These are the types of cervical rib. It can be a full rib or a partial rib or a partial rib with a cord or a full fibrous cord. Whatever it is, it can be causing thoracic outlet syndrome. So even with the fibrous cord, it can cause thoracic outlet syndrome. So please remember, this is common in young age in females. It is common in young age in females. It is 50% time bilateral. You want you to remember, it is 50% time bilateral. And the diagnosis is very easy. You can diagnose cervical rib by doing a simple test that is by taking an X-ray. By taking an X-ray, neck, AP view will demonstrate the cervical rib very clearly. It can demonstrate the cervical rib. The treatment of cervical rib is also very easy. With the help of cardiothoracic surgeons, with the help of cardiothoracic surgeons, we will excise the rib. Excise the rib with the help of cardiothoracic surgeons. So before surgery, usually the cardiothoracic surgeons used to have CT neck and thorax to know the exact anatomy. To know this exact anatomy, they may advise CT neck and thorax as well as sometimes they will advise angiogram to look for the blood flow and other things. So with the help of angiogram on table and also with the help of CT neck, they will plan for surgery. So the surgery is very simple. We have to go and excise the rib completely. Whether it is a fibrous cord or a non-fibrous cord, we have to excise the rib completely. So cervical rib is a very important topic. Please remember other causes of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome. Other causes of thoracic outlet syndrome, we can divide it into congenital. Congenital, the most common cause I told you is cervical rib acquired. Congenital and acquired, let me discuss one by one. Congenital causes, congenital causes, the bony causes, I already discussed, cervical rib, there can be cervical rib or even long C7 transverse process can also do this same issue. Long C7 transverse process also can do or if there is an abnormal first rib can do, all these are bony causes, first rib abnormal can do or scalene muscle anomalies, scalene muscle, no, the scalene muscle is having some anomaly. Scalene muscle improperly inserted or scalene muscle hypertrophy or some bands, all these things, scalene muscle related. Some scalene muscle related can also cause this. And sometimes the patients having a huge pendulous breast. Pendulous breast or some people will be always having a sagging shoulder like this. Such sagging shoulders. Pendulous breast, sagging shoulders, all these are congenital causes. Acquired causes are very easy. Any fracture of first rib, any fracture of clavicle or injury to scalene muscle, scalene muscle injury. So, scalene muscle injury can cause this problem and any soft tissue injury in this area, any surgical scar, surgical or soft tissue injury in the neck. These are all the various causes of acquired thoracic outlet syndrome. These are, these are the various causes of acquired causes and in this is the most common cause is cervical rib. So please don't forget the most common cause of thoracic outlet syndrome is cervical rib. Let me show you the images now. This is a picture showing you the scalene triangle. You can note the scalene triangle image, classical image anteriorly scalene as anterior, posteriorly scalene as medius. You can see the subclavian artery and the thing coming out. Okay, This is an x-ray showing you the cervical rib. You can see bilateral, it is an incomplete rib. It is not complete. It is an incomplete rib seen bilaterally. So this is one of the classical case. You can see here the girl is having a bony swelling above the clavicle and already she is having full of gangrene of the fingers and also the finger is having ischemic ulcers. So this is a classical case. Nowadays we are not seeing this type of cases. This is a very old picture. The case is having a typical cervical rib. Okay. These are the points I want you to remember from the cervical rib. I hope you are understanding. We have discussed two swellings. The bony swelling cervical rib and the solid swelling carotid body tumor. Now we are moving on to the next topic on branchial cyst. On branchial cyst. So branchial cyst. So please understand. I hope you all know this basic anatomy. We have six pharyngeal arches. From this six arches only we develop all the structures in the neck. I hope you all remember this in embryology. So these are the six pharyngeal arches on right side and left side. So what actually happens embryologically is the second arch grows and fuses with the sixth arch like this. This is what actually happens. The second arch grows down and fuses with the sixth arch and this area which is known as a pouch, this is known as pharyngeal pouch will disappear. 
the second arch will go down and fuse with the sixth arch and the pouch formed in between will disappear. If it is not disappearing that is known as branchial cyst. That is known as branchial cyst. But another anomaly is the second arch will grow and will not fuse with the sixth arch and it is remaining as an opening. It remains as an opening like this. This opening is known as branchial sinus or fistula. It is known as branchial sinus or fistula. So, very simple concept. The most common anomaly is second arch anomaly. So, we can this similar anomaly can also happen in other arches also, but the most common anomaly is second arch anomaly. The failure of fusion results in failure of fusion and persistence remains as branchial sinus and fistula. Fused, fused with the pouch remaining patent, with the pouch patent is known as branchial cyst. So, with this two in mind, please come to the patient's neck. I am drawing the patient's neck now. Where are they seen? Where are they seen? I am telling you again. The branchial cyst is seen in anterior stenocleidomastoid, anterior to stenocleidomastoid in the upper third. In the upper third and in the upper third anterior to stenocleidomastoid, we have this. Upper third anterior to stenocleidomastoid, we have this thing branchial cyst and branchial fistula is seen in the lower third please remember branchial fistula the opening is seen in the lower third anterior to sternocleidomastoid anterior to sternocleidomastoid muscle so fistula will have a tract which will go and where does it open fistula means it will have an opening in the lower end it will go inside and open at some place where does it open it opens in the tonsillar fossa please don't forget it opens posterior to tonsil in the tonsillar fossa it opens posterior to tonsil. So, posterior to tonsil inside the tonsillar fossa it opens. So, this is a classical basic point I want to tell you here. I told you if there is a second arch anomaly the opening is seen in the lower third. Second arch anomaly is most common. Second arch anomaly causes opening in the lower third. Please remember second arch anomaly has a opening in the lower third. If it is a first arch anomaly where is the opening seen? That is the question. If it is a first arch anomaly where is the opening scene if it is a third arch anomaly where is the opening scene so please remember first arch anomaly will have a pre auricular sinus it will have a pre auricular sinus is seen in first arch anomaly the third arch anomaly will have a opening in the clavicular area in the clavical area supraclavicular or clavicular area you have a opening in third arch anomaly okay it is a clavicular or suprasternal sinus suprasternal sinus you can get a sinus in the clavicle or in the suprasternal but the most common is second arch only the most common is second arch anomaly so other things are just for completion it is there in Bailey and Love so I am telling you all these things so please remember branchial cyst and branchial fistula the branchial cyst and branchial fistula you should know the lining epithelium so branchial cyst is lined by squamous epithelium squamous epithelium whereas branchial fistula is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium ciliated columnar epithelium branchial cyst is not transluminant it, though it is a liquid swelling it is containing a thick content so it is translumination negative it is translumination negative it is translumination negative and it contains cholesterol crystals it's a repeat mcq cholesterol crystals are present in this fluid it is containing a cholesterol crystals such type of cholesterol crystals are also seen in hydrocele but it is translumination negative here hydrocele is translumination positive which is a cyst with a cholesterol crystals present and translumination positive is hydrocele if the translumination negative is branchial cyst okay so now i want to tell you this branchial sinus this branchial sinus or branchial fistula how does it go course of it i told you it starts from lower third of sternocleidomastoid muscle from there from there it passes between the common carotid artery bifurcation the, it passes between the common carotid artery bifurcation and it pierces the superior constrictor of pharynx pierces superior constrictor of pharynx and finally enters into the tonsillar fossa this is the course of this congenital branchial fistula we call this as congenital branchial fistula please don't forget we call give the name for this as congenital branchial fistula or sinus 
if there is something congenital means there is something acquired is also present what is acquired acquired is a complication of branchial cyst so complication of branchial cyst is it can go for infection it can go for infection so it gets infected and you guys what do you do you think it is an abscess and you open it you put in drainage so what happens there is also acquired branchial fistula or acquired branchial sinus so can you tell me acquired branchial sinus where is it seen acquired branchial sinus opening is seen in the upper third of sternocleidomastoid muscle congenital is seen in the lower third of sternocleidomastoid muscle so acquired branchial sinus is seen in the upper third how to differentiate whether it is an acquired opening or a congenital opening acquired opening is seen in the upper third congenital opening is seen in the lower third please don't forget this point and another complication of branchial cyst is it can produce branchiogenic carcinoma branchiogenic cancer which is nothing but a squamous cell cancer the type of this cancer is squamous cell cancer if it is arising from the branchial sinus remnant it can be also adeno cancer mostly it is squamous cell cancer and it can be also adeno cancer if it arises from branchial sinus remnant from the branchial sinus remnant if it is happening it is known as adeno cancer so we have to evaluate them by means of investigation of choice is ccct ccct neck that will show you the swelling arising in the very posterior place and if you want to identify the sinus opening we can do branchial sinogram branchial sinogram is done that will show you the track of it where it is going and where it is ending so treatment of branchial cyst is excision very carefully we have to excise the branchial cyst excision is a treatment for branchial cyst for branchial fistula please remember for branchial fistula i have to do step ladder incision in the neck i have to do multiple incisions like this one incision two incision three incision like that i have to make step ladder incision and i have to remove the complete track that is an mcq asked in the exam the type of incision needed for branchial fistula is step ladder incision by step ladder incisions i have to remove the tract completely by putting step ladder incision remove tract completely is a point for branchial fistula so please don't forget branchial fistula is a high yield mcq for your exam so branchial cyst and branchial fistula so this is a picture showing you a branchial cyst in the upper third of sternocleidomastoid muscle you can see the branchial cyst in the upper third it is infected and if i am going to open it it will become a if i am going to open it it will become a congenital uh, acquired branchial fistula if i am going to open it it will become acquired branchial fistula so this is a ct scan will show you where it is located what are the surrounding relations we can find it out you can see we are excising a branchial cyst completely so this is a picture showing you a congenital branchial fistula in the lower third of sternocleidomastoid muscle for these cases i have to do a branchial fistulogram like this and i have to excise that tract by means of serial serial serialization i have to excise it completely excision of the tract is most important okay so the next question is classically about this cystic hygroma cystic hygroma is a sequestration of lymphatics in the neck please remember cystic hygroma is a sequestration of lymphatics cystic hygroma is a congenital sequestration of lymphatics of lymphatics in the neck it is very common in patient presence in newborn period it is associated with what are the syndromes it is associated with with the, some syndromes like turner syndrome like turner syndrome and other trisomies like trisomy 21 18 all these things are associated problems it can be seen in turner syndrome so what is the problem the pro baby is presenting with a huge swelling in the posterior triangle of neck this is posterior triangle of neck the posterior triangle of neck there is a huge swelling in the posterior triangle of neck and this is the earliest swelling one can note in the human beings the earliest swelling in the human beings is this this in fact can be diagnosed on antenatal ultrasound itself we can find it out and we have to expect this these babies can even present as obstructed labor also these babies can present as obstructed labor also we should be ready for that they can present as obstructed labor also there are many complications from this cystic hygroma the complications include it can it can cause respiratory difficulty breathing difficulty babies can develop respiratory difficulty or sometimes it can go for spontaneous resolution also that also has happened 
spontaneous resolution can also happen and please remember it can produce obstructed labor in the newborn period before the birth itself it can cause the problem it can produce an obstructed labor so it is a condition which needs definitely treatment no doubt it needs a treatment so the treatment of this condition in olden days i still remember 10 years back in a pediatric surgery department they used to do conservative neck dissection conservative neck node dissection they used to do conservative neck node dissection for these type of cases that is nothing but removal of all the neck nodes it is a morbid surgery but it was done in those days but now the latest treatment is completely different the latest treatment is what we can inject sclerotherapy we can inject sclerotherapy injection it's the latest treatment the sclerosins we are going to use are nothing but pisibanil or bleomycin are the sclerosins used to inject into this pisibanil is old name ok432 it's a old name it is a expected mcq from billion love what is the sclerosin ideally used for cystic acromias pisibanil and bleomycin so we don't use chemotherapy or radiotherapy they are all not needed but pisibanil in, in, injection of sclerosin is enough if you are going to do dissection there is high chances of recurrence there it is very complicated surgery also but people still are doing dissection it is having risk of recurrence is present on conservative neck dissection so but we have to we can do surgery dissection neck dissection also but the, please remember this this question is an expected mcq pc banil injection sclerosin is an expected mcq this is the liquid filled swelling in the posterior triangle so don't forget branchial cyst and cystic hygroma the last topic i am coming on now is laryngoseal the last topic i am coming on now is on laryngoseal so laryngoseal to understand laryngoseal you should understand the anatomy of this is hyoid bone anatomy of larynx hyoid bone thyroid cartilage thyroid cartilage cricoid cartilage the tracheal rings one by one the tracheal rings so you all very well know these are the membranes this is known as thyrohyoid membrane this is thyrohyoid membrane thyrohyoid membrane this is thyrohyoid membrane and this what i am drawing now is cricothyroid membrane this is cricothyroid membrane please don't forget this is cricothyroid membrane and you all know this anatomy very well so here after the of, of, of the cricoid uh, cricoid membrane so there is first ring of trachea second ring third ring it keeps going on like this so now what actually happens what actually happens this fellow is a nadas from blower or a trumpet blower or a school teacher who is always shouting because of shouting and other things these guys will develop weakness these guys will develop weakness in the thyrohyoid membrane they develop weakness in the thyrohyoid membrane and the laryngeal mucosa will protrude out like this on both sides it can happen weakness of the thyrohyoid membrane results in protrusion of laryngeal mucosa with the formation of the formation of a swelling known as laryngoseal so for completion sake let me tell you this cricothyroid membrane is the place where you do emergency needle tracheostomy emergency needle tracheostomy is done in cricothyroid membrane this is also known as cricothyroidotomy known as cricothyroidotomy tracheostomy is done between the second and third or fourth rings usually tracheostomy done with the help of second or third fourth rings usually but in an emergency conditions we put a needle in this place in, the, in this place we put a needle this is known as cricothyroid membrane cricothyroidotomy cricothyroidotomy very emergency surgery situations we do this so we're coming to our topic which is laryngoseal the laryngoseal has some classical clinical features it is having cough impulse positive cough impulse is present when you ask them to cough they cough cough impulse the swelling becomes more prominent moves with the deglutition moves with the deglutition and if you take an x-ray x-ray will show you the presence of these swellings i'll show you the x-ray x-ray shows both air filled swelling so it moves with deglutition and because it is air filled it will have resonant on percussion resonant on percussion so cough impulse present moves with deglutition and resonant on percussion are the various points i want to tell you here so x-ray will help you diagnose this and the treatment is we have to repair it repair the defect that is a treatment very simple treatment you have to repair the defect so these are the swellings which moves with the deglutition i'm telling you the swelling is moving with deglutition uh, final mbba students you can get a question what are the swellings movement with deglutition seen 
movement with deglutition, what are the swellings seen? Very simple straightforward MCQ. So, what are the swellings moving with deglutition? You all very well know thyroid swelling moves with deglutition. Thyroglossal cyst can move with deglutition as well as protrusion of tongue. Laryngoceal will move with the deglutition. Subhyoid bursa will move with deglutition. Subhyoid bursa. Midline dermoid will move with deglutition. Midline dermoid. So, these are the swellings which can move with the deglutition. So, movement with deglutition are seen with all these things. So, please do not forget laryngoceal can be identified by moving with the deglutition. So, coming to the last swelling that is pharyngeal pouch or Zenker's diverticulum which I have discussed in esophagus module in detail but I am just going to give you an outline here. Pharyngeal pouch or Zenker's diverticulum is an air filled swelling in the posterior triangle. It is a defect in which area? It is coming out through which area? This is cricopharyngeal muscle. Sorry. It is cricopharyngeal muscle and here this is a midline and this is thyropharyngeus muscle. Now you have a defective area known as Killian's triangle. This is known as Killian's triangle. This is known as Killian's triangle. Herniation of the pharyngeal mucosa, herniation of the pharyngeal mucosa through this triangle is known as Zenker's diverticulum. So, Zenker's is most common in old men above 60 years most common in old age above 60 years it will have a swelling in the posterior triangle of neck swelling it happens through Killian's triangle it is a false diverticulum please remember it is not a true diverticulum it is a false diverticulum it contains only mucosa and submucosa false diverticulum and the classical clinical feature is these guys present to you with the dysphagia with the dysphagia so, the main reason for this problem is this cricopharyngeal muscle is in spasm. This is a spasm of the cricopharyngeal muscle. Therefore, we call this condition also as cricopharyngeal achalasia. We call them also as cricopharyngeal achalasia. So, this investigation of choice for this condition is barium swallow. So, barium swallow is the investigation of choice for these cases and treatment of choice is diverticulectomy. We have to remove the diverticulum by surgery diverticulectomy plus cricopharyngeal myotomy is the treatment of choice it's a treatment of choice latest treatment now is dolman's operation latest treatment is dolman's endoscopic stapling operation i have discussed all about these things in esophagus module this is just for completion i'm telling you here Endo dolman's endoscopic stapling procedure so we do a dolman's endoscopic stapling procedure for this Zenker's diverticulum. Show you the images. The cystic agroma, you can see the thyrohyoid membrane and the other membranes I discussed with you. You can see the classical laryngoceal on this guy. On the right side, there is a classical laryngoceal. If you take an x-ray, you can find out the air filled cavities on an x-ray. You can see the typical air filled cavities on this x-ray. This is about the laryngoceal. So, this is about the laryngoceal and I hope you are clear with all the next swellings we have discussed. Carotid body tumor. Please do not forget in carotid body tumor. Lyrosine, carotid body tumor, lyrosine, do not forget. Okay, you should not forget carotid body tumor, lyrosine. So, please do not forget cervical rib, various tests of cervical rib is a repeat, repeat MCQ. Please do not forget branchial cyst. Please do not forget the branchial cyst. Remanent is a second arch remanent, is common. Cystic hygroma, injection pisibanil, do not forget cystic hygroma, injection pisibanil, and do not forget laryngoceal. So, laryngoceal is a air filled cavity defect in the thyrohyoid membrane. Please do not forget that. And finally, Zenker's diverticulum. Zenker's diverticulum. So, in this, the posterior triangle swellings are cervical rib, cystic hygroma, and Zenker's are the posterior triangle swellings. These are all the posterior triangle swellings. Carotid body tumor, branchial cyst, and laryngoceal are swellings in the carotid triangle, in the anterior triangle. In carotid triangle, these swellings are seen. So, that completes this module. I hope you understood the module and you like the module. Thank you.